Welcome to the Lord's house uh, today. Uh, those of you who are physically with us in the building this morning and those of you who are joining us online for our All Saints Sunday uh, observance. Uh, All Saints Day is the 1st of November, and it's the day where the church remembers all of those who have gone before us in faith and where we remember that we also are saints. Our prayers today will focus on uh, giving thanks for those who have gone before us. Uh, the message this morning will focus on our own sainthood as we dig deeply into what John writes us in our uh, second reading this morning, where he reminds us of the great love that the Father has lavished on us, that we should be the children of God. So welcome uh, to our worship service this morning. Those of you in the building have your uh, order of service, and we'd ask you to follow along with that, and that you'd also not share it with other people uh, with you this morning. And uh, those of you who are online, of course, will see the service on your uh, TV, computer, laptop, whatever it is that you're using to uh, follow the service uh, today. Our opening hymn this morning is uh, Sing with All the Saints in Glory. I invite you to stand as we begin the service today with our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace, for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. We pause for a moment 
of self-examination and reflection upon God's word. We say together, Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for yours, his sake forgives you all your sins. As an ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn. first reading for this All Saints Sunday is taken from the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation, beginning at the ninth verse. Here we are given a glimpse of the saints in heaven and are told of their standing before the throne of God with the angels. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders, and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. 
And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from the first epistle of John, the third chapter, beginning at the first verse. In these verses we read of God in his love calling us his children and reminding us that when we see him in heaven, we will be holy like him, having had our sins washed away in the blood of the Lamb, our Lord Jesus Christ. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue with our anthem sung by Ashley Black. pain this world can never comprehend a love that will not end the light that always will remain for there beyond the edge of time is wisdom so divine we long to see the shining way to save 
As you are able, please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Here in the Beatitudes, Jesus proclaims words of blessedness to his gathered followers and tells us who are the blessed of God. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Together we state, confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We continue with our hymn for the day of the sermon, hymn for all the saints, and we sing stanzas one through four. And for those at home using their hymnal, it's hymn number 677. Congregation may be seated.
to each and every one of you, God's grace and mercy and peace through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. There is a story, maybe good part legend, but nonetheless, that dates back to the early church and to the life of St. John, the Apostle. And the story goes something like this. John, as you may know, spent a good deal of time in exile on an island called Patmos because of his faith. But he was then released from his exile, and he was able to rejoin the churches in Asia Minor. And while he was at one of these churches, he met a young man who had recently converted to the faith. And he took this young man under wing and began to teach him and help him. And the hope was that this young man might grow to be a pastor someday. But John, being the last of the living apostles, the only one of the twelve who made it to old age, was also a man in demand, and so he wasn't able just to stay at this one place. He had to travel to other churches and help them as well. And so as he was getting prepared for a journey, he decided that he would take this young man and put him under the care of the local bishop so that the bishop could continue his instruction and that in due time he might indeed become a pastor. And so John took off, went to all these uh, churches that he had to go to and spent a considerable amount of time on the road. And then in due time, came back home again. And among the first things that he did was he went to the bishop and he said, so how's our guy doing? And the bishop looked at him and said, he's dead. Which was a bit of a shock to John because he was a young guy. And so he asked a few more questions and the bishop said, well, not that dead. He's dead to God. Which was even more alarming to John. And as the story was told, it, it turns out the man had kind of gone back into his former ways again. And he had got himself hooked up with a gang of thieves and robbers and was living with them up in the hillside outside the city. So here's what John did. Now remember, John is not a young man anymore. He's at least into his 80s by this point in time. John asks the bishop, he says, give me your horse. And he jumps onto the horse, as the story goes, rides up to this encampment in the hills, jumps off his horse when he gets to the guards. The guards try to send him away, but he will have nothing of it. He allows himself to be arrested All he wants to do is to get in to the encampment and to see if he can find this man again. And sure enough, he does. And as the story goes, sure enough, the man comes back and he resumes his education. Now, like I say, there may be a good bit of legend in that story, but... In most legends, there's a kernel of truth, too. And when I first heard that story, the question that I pondered and pondered was, what would make an elderly man who has certainly done more than his fair share, so to speak, for the church of God to get that worked up over one guy who probably doesn't want what he has on offer. Why would an elderly man commandeer a horse, jump on it, ride up to the Hell's Angels encampment on the edge of town? Maybe he rode a motorcycle up, I don't know. Go in there with all of these guys in their vests and their leathers and whatever else they wore back in those days unarmed, to rescue one guy. And I think, just maybe, just maybe, 
Part of the answer lies in this morning's second reading. St. John writes this letter, and like a lot of letters, it starts off with a bit of a bang, and then it goes into a discussion of what it means to be a Christian. And the letter is moving along just fine through the first two chapters. And then we come to the beginning of chapter 3. And the beginning of chapter 3 of John's letter is like a little explosion going off in the text. He's talked about all this kind of doctrine stuff, this teaching stuff, all this stuff that's very important, but kind of dry. And then he goes, behold, and maybe the King James, old King James translation uh, does the best that anyone's ever done with this particular text. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. Boom! Boom! Behold this, people. What he wants you and me to do and what he wanted that young man to do and partly why he could get on that horse or whatever it is that he rode out to that encampment and put himself in all of that danger is he wanted that man and he wants you and me and his readers back then to behold the love that God has bestowed on us. Not love that we have earned, not love that we have achieved, not love that we deserve, but that is bestowed, that is given. It's the love that St. John himself knew all too well. John was one of the Twelve apostles, one of those who was closest to Jesus. And while he was a great apostle and one of the inner circle of the apostles, he was by no means a perfect man. Do you remember what he did to that Samaritan, wanted to do to that Samaritan town? We talked about this in Bible class last week. As Jesus was on his way down to Jerusalem, they come to the Samaritan village. And the people in the Samaritan village want nothing to do with Jesus simply because he's going to Jerusalem. They don't even want to hear him. He's going to Jerusalem. We want nothing to do with him. And James and John, the two brothers, sons of Zebedee, what do they want to do to that town? Let's nuke the place, Jesus. Let's bring down fire from heaven on these people and let's blast them because they've rejected you. And for that, they got the title, The Sons of Thunder. Not hard to understand. And they also got the rebuke of Jesus. That's not how we do things, Jesus. Have you ever seen me nuke a town? <laughs> no, that's not what we're here to do. But just as with Peter and all the rest, every time they messed up, Jesus doesn't fire any of them. He keeps loving them. He keeps pouring out that love upon them to the point that at the time when John later in life writes the Gospel of John, he has a kind of an interesting way of identifying himself as he writes that Gospel. He rarely refers to himself by name, but simply calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's not that he, any of the other disciples weren't loved, but he knew that love, that undeserved, agape, unmerited gift that God bestows upon His children. Behold that love. Even if you've heard it every Sunday for years and years and years, stop yourself, give yourself a pinch. Behold that love that is bestowed on you. And once you've noticed it again, believe it. Because it changes things for you and for me. Let's go back to the ESV, which we read 
in the service a few moments ago. See what kind of love the Father has given unto us that we should be called the children of God and so we are. John headed off to find that young man that he might behold again the love God had for him but also that he might believe the love that God had for him. Because that love that God had for him changes him. He's not only called a child of God, he is a child of God. He's been adopted into God's family, warts and all problems and all, issues and all, God has adopted him. Adoption is a legal thing. It's a thing by which a person who's not born into a particular family is enabled to receive all the rights and privileges that come with being a part of the family. And this young man has been adopted. But it's more than just, if you've ever gone through it, you know it's more than just a legal process. Years ago, and some of you know this, I am the adopted father of one of our children. And when the time came to do the adoption, this was much more than a legal thing. Because when you adopt a child, you have to be ready to say to that child, I love you every bit as much as I love my other children. That I will do for you everything that I will do for the other children. That I will give you all of the advantages and privileges that I can. And that I will even die for you if I have to. Because I have adopted you. And that's the very same thing that God has said to you and to me. You see, God has a natural child. He has an only begotten Son from all eternity, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance of the Father by whom all things were made. If we had said the Nicene Creed this morning, which maybe we should have just for that line, we'd be reminded of that. And he loves that son with everything that he has. But in adopting you and me, he said to us, I love you every bit as much as I love him. Every bit as much as I love him. You are my children. And that's exactly what Jesus prays for in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he's crucified. Among the long list of things that's in his prayers that night is that the Father would indeed love the disciples every bit as the Father loves him. And the Father loves you and me so much that he'd even put his own natural son in our place for our sins and die for all that separates us from Him, so that we might be His children, so that we might be saints. 
We're born into this world as sinners. No one ever, ever has to teach somebody to do wrong. At least I was not. Nobody needed to sit down with me at age two and say, you've been perfect up to now, but, you know, it's not a perfect world and here's how you, you behave in an unperfect world. We just learn that because it's in nature to us, our sinful nature. But God has come along and he says, no, I'm going to make you something more than that. I'm going to make you a child. I'm going to make you an heir. I'm going to make you a saint. I'm going to adopt you. That's the love I bestow. And for that reason, John would mount the horse and race into the hillsides to find that adopted son. So that young man, like you and me, might become the people that he has made us to be. Paul Carey, or John carries on, he says, Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him because we shall see him as he is. This morning in the prayers, we'll remember those who have gone before us and who are closer now than they were on this earth to seeing him as he is and who are closer to being like him in every way. And we rejoice that God has gathered them to himself and freed them from their sorrows and made them to be forever with him, his saints. But this isn't just something that applies out there in the sweet by and by somewhere. This is something for you and me still today. No, we don't know yet what the future shape of our eternal life will be like. But we already see him as he is. And we become like him even now. We see him like he is. We see him in the humble forms with which he comes to us still today. Words on a page. Insignificant and small words from a pulpit. A little bit of bread and a tiny sip of wine at the table. A splash of water on our heads in our baptism. We see him as he is, a loving, forgiving, renewing God who takes us as we are. We heard Jesus in the gospel reading this morning, those very familiar words of the Beatitudes. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are all of these people whose circumstance isn't very blessed. Poverty, mourning, hungering. People who in meekness can offer nothing up to God, but can simply and only receive what is bestowed on them. And as we meet him in his word, he meets us where we are in all our poverty, all our meanness, all our sorrow, all our sin. And he blesses us and then he bestows upon us all kinds of new titles so that we might be like him in this world, having seen him as he is, that we might then go out into the world. And he says, blessed are the peacemakers that ones that go out into this messed up world and bring his peace. Blessed are those who reach out and who care and who are pure in heart and who show the mercy of God. And you're even blessed 
if the people around you don't really want to receive it very much. He's gone right into hell and back again to bring you to him. As amazing as John's story is, it's nothing compared to the story of Jesus who mounts not a horse but a cross for you and for me and who goes not to the hell's angels camp on the edge of town but to the cemetery to bring us back from the dead and to say to you and to me, behold, behold, what manner of love is bestowed on us so that we might believe that love because it changed who we are and made us into saints instead of just sinners, the adopted children of God and become what that love does for you and for me to make us like him even though we don't yet see everything like we will someday. Dear friends, behold, believe, become. Amen. Please stand. And now may the peace of God, which passes all our human understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in true faith to life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare to give thanks for those who have gone before us in faith, I invite you to remain standing as we join together to sing the final four verses of the hymn, For All the Saints.
us pray to the Lord our God and Father who raised Jesus from the dead. Almighty God, you have knit your chosen people together in one communion. In the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to newness of life, and so pass with him through the gate of death and the grave to their own joyful resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive our thanks, O Lord, for those who have gone before us with a sign of faith. Today we recall and give thanks for those whom we have known and loved, who are now with you forever. We remember. Alma Lucci. Mary Bell Pohl. Doreen Vivian Marchand. Sandra Lynn Berg. Jason Jeffrey Thomas. Ortwin Adolph Kays. Joy Elizabeth Betty Hebner. Marilyn June Weber. Audrey May Pritchard. Carolyn Ruth Alvin. Reverend Dr. Roger Elson Winger. Leo Red Francis Hill. Amalia Molly Bertha Kartechner. Diane Shirley Helliwell. Kurt Basie. William John Bill Schmidt. Lord God, our shepherd, you gather the lambs of your flock into the arms of your mercy and bring them home. Comfort us with the certain hope of the resurrection to everlasting life and joyful reunion with those we love who have died in the faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless all in authority over us, especially those who work to bring peace and justice, that they may be inclined to your will and walk according to to your commandments. Grant wisdom to our citizens and courage and competence to our leaders. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Preserve all who travel, those in need, the sick and the injured. We lift up to you especially Doris Hahn, Deb Hotflutz, Noreen Fielding, and Helga Drung. Be also with those who have asked for our intercessions, especially the Fridge family in Palestine as they await clearance to come to Canada. Grant to all in need your Holy Spirit that they may abound in confidence in your loving care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gather us now in the blessed sacrament of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, whom saints and angels adore, around your eternal throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Keep us in fellowship with all your saints, O Lord, and bring us at last to the joy of your heavenly kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
won't take a great deal of time with uh, parish announcements uh, this morning, but uh, again, welcome to all those who are worshiping with us. And uh, for those of you who are online, uh, a reminder that the live stream will be ending after the announcements this morning. Uh, if you haven't already signed in uh, using a Gmail account and you don't mind doing that sort of thing, uh, we were happy to know that you were part of the live stream uh, service today. Uh, for those of us, all, for all of us, actually, uh, the shoe boxes for Operation Christmas Child are due today. And if you're going, oops, haven't done that yet, don't panic. Uh, just get the box here in the next few days, and uh, it will get on its way. Um, uh, it's it's not a hard deadline, but uh, the, the box, uh, everything will leave later this week. Reminder too that uh, next week is the uh, pre-call meeting. It will follow right after the end of the 11 o'clock service, beginning probably around 12.30. It will be uh, live streamed. Uh, folks on the live stream will not be able to vote, but there are only going to be procedural motions anyway, we anticipate, at this meeting. If you are going to attend in person, uh, there is no need to RSVP. We'll uh, just to take attendance and allow people to seat themselves in a physically responsible way. If you're an 11 o'clock attender and you're wondering, what am I going to do for lunch? Um, uh, well, of course, you have a little bit of time perhaps to run out and get something, or if you wish to bring something from home, you may indeed eat it here in the church. We just ask that you find a spot that is kind of isolated from other people and, and, and uh, share uh, your meal with your family uh, and, uh, only. And um, there was something else that just rolled through my head here about the meeting, and it went out the other side. Oh, well, we'll send an email out if it's that important. Oh, yes, I know what I was going to say. The whole thing, we're anticipating the whole thing to be over somewhere between 60 and 90 minutes. Uh, these meetings don't get better the longer they go. Um, uh, the, the whole point here is to, to do some things we need to do, hear some reports, and uh, get the process started. So those are our announcements this morning. Again, to those who are watching the live stream, uh, we hope you are blessed by this service. We wish you God's grace and mercy and peace as you go about your week. And to the rest of us here, uh, we will stand momentarily to receive the offering.
生。